Shalom TV, celebrating Jewish culture. Funding for Shalom TV has been provided by the following. And by viewers like you. Hi, I'm uh, Mordechai Becher, and this is Dimensions of the Duff on Shalom TV. Uh, welcome. We uh, explore different ideas from Mishnah, Talmud, traditional uh, Jewish sources, and uh, no continuity is required. Not a bad idea, but each class stands by itself. So I, I'm, my guess is that uh, you are watching this around the time of Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year, either just before or just after, hopefully not on it. Um, you'll hopefully be in synagogue or dipping your apples in honey and having a great meal. Uh, but anyway, I wanted to talk about the shofar. Um, just to watch your, watch your ears, search for the... Uh, I'm just going to blow the shofar, then we're going to talk about it a little bit. For, why not, you know? <laughs> So that was the sound of the shofar. This is a ram's horn, which is the horn of a ram, which is a male sheep. And uh, it has been uh, polished a little bit. And obviously the inside has been drilled out so that it's, a, it's basically a horn which you can blow. And the sounds are basically uh, three major sounds. with what we call a tekiah. That's one long sound. Terua. Nine sounds. And Shvarim. Three shorter sounds. Basically, I want to talk a little bit about what, what is the symbolism of Shofar. There's many, many ideas. If you look in the traditional Rosh Hashanah, Machzor, that's the prayer book for Rosh Hashanah. Many of them cite Rav Sa'adja Gaon, who's one of the great scholars of the 11th century, um, who gives 10 different reasons for the blowing of the shofar or ideas behind the mitzvah, the Torah's commandment to blow the shofar. One which is actually not mentioned, which is not discussed that much, is the idea of the shofar of freedom. People who have been to the Liberty Bell in Philadelphia will probably be aware that on the Liberty Bell is inscribed a verse from Leviticus 25. And the verse from Leviticus 25 is proclaim liberty throughout the land to all its inhabitants thereof. I don't know what thereof means, but whatever. Anyway, so um, in, uh, proclaim liberty throughout the land or freedom throughout the land to all its inhabitants thereof. Now, let me give you the context of that verse. If you look in Leviticus 25, which I have on the first slide here, so the context is this, that we, uh, the agricultural seasons in Israel, uh, in, according to biblical law, are divided into seven-year cycles known as Shemitah, sabbatical year. And, then there are, and, and the sabbatical year is time when people do not plant new crops. They only do as much work as necessary to actually sustain the crops that already exist. And there's also various laws about allowing anyone to come onto your field and take food take fruit and grains, etc., and to let the animals uh, graze on the field, wild animals, etc. In other words, a time where you pretty much let go. And uh, all the stuff you've been working on for all that time, uh, the previous six years, you pretty much declare ownerless, or more correctly, owned by God, not by me. So that's the sabbatical year. In addition to that, there's seven sabbatical cycles, which are seven years, seven times seven years, which is 49 years, obviously. And then the 50th year is known in Hebrew as Yovel, hence the English Jubilee, which is a lousy transliteration of the Hebrew Yovel, Yovel Jubilee. Uh, so 
I know it doesn't sound the same, but it is a transliteration. Uh, you don't have to trust me on this. You can check it out. Uh, anyway, so let me just give you the, um, the context here. So it says at the end, it says, you shall count, safar talacha, you shall count for yourself, seven shabtot shanim, that is seven Sabbaths of years, meaning a Sabbath is seven days. So seven Sabbaths of years would be seven years. Sheva shanim, sheva pamim, seven years, seven times. And these seven periods, Sabbath periods of years, Teisha Arbaim Shana will be 49 years. And then it says, verse 9, You shall uh, pass a shofar of blowing. You shall blow shofar in the seventh month, on the tenth of the month. By the way, that's Yom Kippur. Um, on the Day of Atonement. Ta'aviru shofar b'chol atzachai, you shall blow the shofar throughout the entire land of Israel. V'kidashtem et shnada hamishim shana, you shall sanctify the seventh, uh, sorry, the fiftieth year. Ukratem dror ba'aretz l'chol yoshva, and you shall proclaim freedom in the land for all its inhabitants. Yovel hi, it's the jubilee. Tihye lachem shall be for you. V'shavtem ishel achuzato. And each person shall return to his inheritance and return to his family. Uh, the freedom that is referred to here, at least in the context, is that in biblical times, as you might be aware, the, if a person stole money and could not repay it, if he caused damage and could not repay it, then the court would sell him, meaning he'd become an indentured servant, or if you want to use the term slave, but he'd become a servant to someone, and uh, the sale, the money from his sale, would of course go to paying off his theft or debt. Uh, he would be at this person for, set for, for until the sabbatical year. So if, he's, if he did the crime in the third year of the cycle, he'd be there for four years. If he did the crime in the first year of the cycle, he'd be there for six years. But he goes free in the sabbatical year. The master is obligated to set him free. Now, what if he doesn't want to go free? So you might say that sounds a little weird. What do you mean he doesn't want to go free? But the, the fact is that the Talmud tells us that many, many of these servants did not want to go free because they were treated very well by their owners um, and uh, the law ordained that they be given equivalent food and lodging to the actual owners. They could not be uh, asked to do anything demeaning or work outside their trade. So it's type of, I guess there were people who, who wanted that. So if they chose to stay beyond the sabbatical year, um, they uh, would stay only until the Jubilee year of the 50th, whenever that came, whatever they were in the cycle. Could be seven years from now, could be two years, could be a year from then. But the Jubilee year, everyone has to go free. In other words, no choice is given. Sabbatical year is a choice given. This servant is asked, do you want to go free or you want to stay with the master? If he says, I'll stay with the master, he stays. If he wants to go free, he goes free. Uh, however, when it comes to the Jubilee year, no choice is given, everyone goes free. In addition to that, uh, if land, ancestral land, was sold by a family in the land of Israel, and they sold it, they were destitute, they needed to sell their ancestral land for whatever reason, uh, then they are able to redeem it and until the Jubilee year. And in the Jubilee year, the land goes back, reverts back to the original ancestry. So uh, what it says here is that you shall blow a shofar at the end of Yom Kippur today. It is customary at the end of Yom Kippur, we blow the shofar in synagogue. Uh, I don't know if anyone's, uh, you know, at the very end of Yom Kippur services, um, evening service, we blow the shofar. And the reason for blowing the shofar at that point, uh, it is not to signal people to defrost their bagels, uh, but rather the purpose of the shofar then is to commemorate the shofar that was blown in the Jubilee year, every 50 years in Israel, which proclaimed freedom and liberty throughout the land. So anyway, the, when they uh, made the Liberty Bell, uh, whoever did it, I forgot his name, engraved on it that beautiful verse from Leviticus, proclaim liberty throughout the land. But the verse is not referring to a bell ringing in, around the land. It's referring to a shofar, which proclaims liberty. And it is interesting to note that the Sifri, which is um, one of the oldest rabbinic commentaries on the Torah, actually predates the Mishnah. So the Mishnah was written down about 170 to 200. Uh, the Mishnah is not written in the form of a commentary on the Torah. We've seen Mishnahs in this series, but it's written in the form of just laws, statements of law or statements of cases with the ruling in that particular case. Prior to the Mishnah, there was already a compendium of 
of uh, these laws, but in, it was not in the form of just statements of laws or cases. It was like a commentary on the Torah. So one of them is called Sifra, or Sifri rather, and the Sifri is on the Le- book of Leviticus. And then what the Sifri says, it says that basically God tells the Jewish people, I want you to uh, come before me on Rosh Hashanah, proclaim me as king, uh, talk about the fact that I remember everything. And how do you do it with the Shofar? You proclaim uh, you come before God to ask to be remembered in mercy with a shofar. Basically, what it says is, Ein shofar, Eila shel cherut. She shall blow shofar on Rosh Hashanah to remember, to be remembered, I left out a B, to be remembered before me in mercy with the shofar of freedom. And all shofars are shofars of freedom. So, according to the Sifri, the idea of blowing the shofar is, on Rosh Hashanah, is actually similar to the blowing of the shofar in the Jubilee year, which is to proclaim freedom throughout the land. And I'd like to understand what exactly is the freedom that is being celebrated with the blowing of the, the, blowing of the shofar. So to, uh, to understand this, I want to present another issue, which is Rosh Hashanah, which we know is the day of judgment. What type of uh, attitude do you think people should have on Rosh Hashanah? Be happy? Be celebrating? Well, it's interesting in the book of Nehemiah, book of Nehemiah, I've got it uh, here, in the book of Nehemiah chapter 8, I know there's a lot of text there, but I'll tell you what it says anyway, so you don't have to actually read, God forbid. Uh, but anyway, so the text says this. Um, just to give you the historical context, the, the um, Jews have been living in Israel for 800 years from the time of Joshua. Um, 400 years into that, we built the first temple in Jerusalem, capital of the Jewish people. King David, King Saul, King David, King Solomon, etc., the first temple uh, was destroyed by the Babylonians after 410 years of existence. So uh, in approximately 2,500 years ago, the first temple was destroyed by the Babylonians uh, and under the king Nebuchadnezzar. And the Jews, uh, there was terrible warfare. The Jews were exiled from Israel. Some were left behind. Very small remnant were left behind. Um, uh, but the majority of the Jews uh, were exiled to Babylon. Babylon is modern-day Iraq, and Persia, modern-day Iran. So the first exile of the Jewish people after we were in Israel was to Iran and Iraq. In fact, the Jewish community of Baghdad and the Jewish community of Iran, there's a very small Jewish community in Baghdad, there's a larger Jewish community in Iran, uh, those are the two oldest Jewish communities outside of Israel in the world because they were remnants, probably, uh, at least the Iraqi Jews, were remnants of the exiles who were exiled at the time of the First Temple 2,500 years ago. Now, um, after 70 years in exile in Babylon, the Jews were granted permission to return to Israel. Uh, by the king of Persia. So we were granted, because Persia had taken over the empire at that point. So we were granted permission to go back under Cyrus and uh, two of the great leaders of the Jewish people, Ezra and Nehemiah, uh, were both the leaders who brought the Jews back to Israel. Now, most of the Jews stayed in Babylon. Hence, hundreds of years later, we have the great work Babylonian Talmud, which we study together on, on dimensions of the duff. Uh, but that's much later in history. At this time in history, most Jews stayed in Babylon, and uh, there were and, and a lot and you know thousands of Jews did go back to Israel with Ezra and Nehemiah. Now, and this may come as a surprise to you, or maybe not, but in the 70 years in Babylon, there was massive assimilation. Uh, a lot of the Jews uh, very very quickly um, moved away from Judaism, became very ignorant started to speak the foreign language, Aramaic, not Hebrew anymore. Uh, After a while, there was even a tremendous amount of intermarriage, many Jews marrying Babylonians. Um, And so there was really quite a bit of uh, ignorance and assimilation going on in the Babylonian Jewish community. Uh, Much like has happened in much of the world today, uh, Jews came from Europe to the United States and a lot of Jews just dropped Judaism as they came here um, and... uh, lots of ignorance, assimilation, intermarriage, etc. So this happens on a new phenomenon and it happened back in Babylon as well. So however, thousands of Jews did come back to Israel with Ezra and Nehemiah and they rebuilt the city of Jerusalem. They rebuilt the walls around Jerusalem as the, uh, it tells us in the book of Nehemiah with a sword in one hand and a trowel in the other. The trowel to put down the, um, what do you use a trowel for? 
uh, yeah, uh, you know, to put the uh, mortar between the bricks and the stones, etc., and the sword to defend against enemies. We were trying to build, and the enemies were trying to destroy. A bit of a modern image as well. We've been trying to build the land of Israel, state of Israel, for the past 60 years. Our enemies have not been trying to build anything. They've been trying to destroy. Uh, anyway, so um, after having built the walls around Jerusalem and the city, so this is, where, this is how it starts, and again, you can see it there. It says, all the people gathered like as one to the, uh, to the courtyard in the open place before the water gate. Water gate was the gate from which they brought water into Jerusalem from one of the springs around the city of Jerusalem. And they said to Ezra, the scribe, they said, they asked him to bring the Torah of Moses and to read it before him. Before them. You know, keep in mind, they were ignorant. They'd come back to Israel. They were inspired by building Israel, building Jerusalem. And they said to Ezra, bring the Torah, read it in front of us. So Ezra brings the Torah before the people, men and women, anyone who understood on the first day of the seventh month. Now, for those who don't know, the first day of the seventh month in the Jewish year is actually Rosh Hashanah. Uh, seventh month from Nisan. We count the year uh, for many purposes as the first month being the month of the Exodus because that's when we were created as a nation. That's Nisan. So that we have this bizarre phenomenon that since we count the year as the first month being Nisan, when we got out of Egypt, that means the new year is Rosh Hashanah is actually in the seventh month. I know this doesn't make any sense. I don't really have time to explain it now. But basically, Rosh Hashanah is the seventh month of the year if you count from Exodus. It's the first month of the year because it's the anniversary of the creation of the human being. So therefore, it's the new year. Okay, hopefully, hopefully that clarified things to you. Anyway, so on the first day of the seventh month is actually Rosh Hashanah. So the Jews are gathered at, in Jerusalem, just outside this, in the area outside the water gate. And they've asked Ezra, it's on Rosh Hashanah, they've asked Ezra to bring the Torah before them. And it says that Ezra read the Torah to the whole people who were gathered there from morning until midday, in front of the men, in front of the women, in front of everyone who could understand. And he read, for the, and he read the Torah to all these people. And actually it tells us there that, the, that uh, Nehemiah, uh, that he had the Levites translate everything because a lot of people didn't understand the Hebrew. So they translated and explained everything. And the people are listening to the Torah being read. It says that uh, they read the Torah and they gave the interpretation. And then Nehemiah, whose name is also known as Artashasta, which was his Aramaic name, and Ezra the scribe, uh, read the Torah to the people and they said, look, today is a holy day to God. Don't cry. Don't mourn. Because you know why? Because all the people were crying when, he heard the, when they heard the Torah. I guess the people uh, realized how far they were away from the ideal and how far they were away from what the Torah wants and they started crying. Now, you know, I speak at synagogues very often. I am a uh, sometimes rabbi of a shul. I am a sometimes, you know, once a month. Anyway, so, you know, if a rabbi of a synagogue gets up on Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, and he gives a sermon and the whole community bursts into tears, uh, do you think the rabbi would be happy about that? The truth is, I think most rabbis would be very happy. They inspired people. They're not sleeping. People are not talking about the stock market. People are actually crying, listening to my, you know, not crying with pain, but I mean, they're crying out of inspiration. The words, I think most rabbis are pretty happy with that. So here, all the Jews burst into tears and Ezra and Nehemiah, their reaction to the Jews is, don't cry. Don't mourn. Today is holy. And he goes on to say, verse 10, and he said to them, go and eat. Good foods, really fat, fat foods, right? Go and eat good foods. Shetumam takim, drink sweet drinks. Shilchumanot, send presents to those who don't have, because today is holy to God. Don't be sad, because as it's, it's uh, hold your peace today is holy. Don't grieve, right? Um, because the, because God's joy is your strength. The joy of God is your strength. And the Levites went and silenced everyone and said, "Don't cry. Today is holy." And all the people went to eat to drink and to give presents to each other and to make a great festival because they understood what was being told them. So here we have a very interesting precedent for to set the tone for Rosh Hashanah. That Rosh Hashanah is a time which is solemn, yes, but it's not a time that the Jews should be mourning, even though normally a person's being judged for their life, capital crime judgment. Uh, you're being judged for your life on Rosh Hashanah, you'd expect that we wouldn't be happy at all. But the truth is, Jewish law says you dress up in nice clothing, you get a haircut and shave beforehand. You know, we all, we're all 
nice and clean and showered and you know, cologne and everything else. And not only that, we eat great food, we drink good wine, and of course there we are uh, standing there being judged for our very life and existence. So what is the, what's, the, what's the joy here? What's the happiness? Because you see from the Chemia that the Jews are supposed to be happy. So I think the idea is this. If we have a look, this is a Mishnah in Tractate Rosh Hashanah, which is of course the tractate of the Talmud that deals with Rosh Hashanah, and I've got the Mishnah here on the screen, and it says the following, Ba'arba prakim ha'olam nidon, there are four times a year that the world is judged. Be'pesach ala on Passover, we judged in terms of grain, that is to say the, how will the crops be this year? Lousy crop, good crop, excess wheat, etc. Ba'atzeret on Shavuot, Al Perot Ha'ilan regarding the fruit of the trees. But Rosh Hashanah on Rosh Hashanah, Kol Ba'ei Olam of Rim Lefanav Kivnei Maron. On Rosh Hashanah, all inhabitants of the world are judged before God like Bnei Maron, as it says, He who understands all their hearts and He who created their hearts together and understands all their activities. Uvechag and on Sukkot. Nidonim alamayim, we judge by water, on, on water. So it's interesting here, you notice, I just want to analyze this Mishnah a little bit. So you notice a discrepancy in the pattern of the Mishnah? I'll, I'll tell it to you again, so you can, you can hear this yourself. At four seasons, divine judgment is passed on the world. Pesach, Passover, it's judged on grain. On Shavuot, we're judged on fruit of the tree. Rosh Hashanah, everyone passes before God, like Bnei Maron. And on Sukkot, we're judged on water. The discrepancy is that on all the three other times, it tells you what you're judged on. On Rosh Hashanah, it doesn't say we are judged on our existence. It says how we are judged, not what we're judged on. You hear what I'm saying? I see some lack of comprehension there. Yeah, okay. Right, in other words, instead of the consistent way of doing it would have been this. On Pesach, we're judged on grain. On Shavuot, we're judged on fruit of the trees. Rosh Hashanah, we're judged on life. And on Sukkot, we're judged on water. That would be consistent. But it's not consistent. It says, on Pesach, we're judged on grain. Shavuot, on fruit of the tree. Pesach, we're judged like B'nai Meron. Doesn't explain what that means. Right? And on Sukkot, we're judged on water. So on Rosh Hashanah, the emphasis here appears to be on the wrong thing. The, emph- the, emph- the emphasis seems to be on the wrong syllable. The emphasis seems to be on the wrong, not on what we're being judged, but on how we are being judged. And the Talmud says, what does it mean, B'nai Maron? So I've got the Talmud down there, Gemara. There are three opinions, what B'nai Maron or Meron means. One says, what it means is, Kibnei Imrana, like sheep. Sheep going out of the corral. As they go out of the corral, each one is examined by the shepherd to decide if it will be lamb stew or if it will get shorn or whatever it is. So it's one by one they go through the ga- narrow gate. Reish Lakish says, Kamalot Beit Meron. Reish Lakish says it's like the stairs, the, the, not the stairs, but the path up to a place called Meron, which is a hill, a mountain in Israel, which is a very steep, narrow path that was really was only big enough for one pedestrian to walk up at a time. Nowadays, it's large enough for two Egged buses to go up. Uh, but at the time, it was only one pedestrian, so it was one at a time. And uh, Rav Yehuda says in the name of Shmuel, Kechayalot Shel Beit David, it's actually like the soldiers of King David. That is to say, each soldier was judged, uh, was inspected individually. You know, they checked their gun, the canteen, the whole works, the boots polished, so on and so forth. So it's all individual. The emphasis, however, here is that each one is judged individually. And that seems to be the essential idea here. That is, the, the, it's the, the, the Mishnah is saying Rosh Hashanah, the essential component of the judgment of Rosh Hashanah is not so much what we're being judged on, i.e. life or existence, etc., but rather it's how we are judged, which means each person individually. So what's the, what's the idea behind it? So I think the meaning of it is the following, this is at least what I heard from my teacher, Ramosha Shapiro. The meaning is this. The Rosh Hashanah, we are being told that just as, you know, when God created, the way the book of Genesis tells it, God creates one person, one individual. And the one individual that he creates, Adam, 
who combines Eve, Adam and Eve together. He splits the human unit and more humans, etc. The question you could ask is, is it not possible for God to have created a million people in one shot? God could have created millions in one shot. Why did he create one person? Why is that? The Talmud says, so the person should understand that it was worth creating the world even for one person. One human being who acts in an appropriate manner. One human being who fulfills his purpose. One human being who strives for perfection. It's worth the entire world for that one human being. So the judgment on Rosh Hashanah is each person individually. What it's saying is that each person granted free will, granted this incredible freedom to create or to destroy, to perfect or to corrupt. That's the greatness of the human being. And the person stands there before God and, and, and the, the judgment, the scrutiny is the following. God looks at you and says, if, the, if you were the one person for whom the world was created, would I be happy? So we have to understand, if I, am, if I was the one person for whom the world was created, I'm it. Right? Like that movie that was recently, the, I forgot what it was called, Legend. There's one guy left on earth. etc. Of course, there, there are all these zombies as well. But I mean, but you've got one person left. If I'm the one person, have I exercised my freedom of will in such a way that, 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 that creation is justified for me or not? So on the one hand, that can make you nervous. It's pretty heavy. But on the other hand, there's a tremendous joy in that because what it means is that, that this freedom that has been given to me, the freedom of will, which is the reason I'm being judged on Rosh Hashanah is because I'm being given freedom of will. I have free will. If I didn't have free will, I could not be judged. So the celebration, the shofar, is a, is a sign to me of my freedom of will, that I am a free person with free will to be used in an appropriate manner and that that shofar declares that freedom. It also reminds me of creation because I, as opposed to animals, as opposed to angels, as opposed to any other element of creation, I, the human being, is the only really free creature. Everything else is bound by instinct. Everything else is bound by nature. Only the human being is not bound by that. Only the human being is free. And the shofar is there to remind us of this incredible freedom that the human being has, what we call free will. And it's because of that freedom that we are judged. And because we are judged, because we have that freedom, that is reason to have joy. We don't have wild celebrations. That's not what Rosh Hashanah is about. But it's nevertheless a time of eating good food, drinking. We act as free people. We blow the shofar to indicate that freedom because what we're trying to emphasize is it's in French, I think they say noblesse oblige, right? That nobility gives obligation. The nobility of the human being that we are created with free will obligates us to act in an appropriate way. That's my obligation. And when we act that way, hopefully God looks at us and he says, if the world was just created for this guy, it would be fine. So that's a little bit about the idea of the shofar. And one more thing I want to mention. Every day in our weekday service, we actually say, we ask God to blow a great shofar for our freedom and raise a banner to gather in our exiles, gather us together from the four corners of the earth. So really the shofar that will indicate the, the redemption is also a shofar of freedom. And that is the ultimate freedom where we can actually exercise our free will without anything preventing us from doing that. No war, disease, poverty, etc. And that is what we look forward to. So have a happy, sweet new year. And enjoy the shofar. Thanks very much. If you'd like to purchase a copy of Rabbi Mordecai Becker's book, Gateway to Judaism, The What, How, and Why of Jewish Life, visit www.artscroll.com. And for information about Rabbi Becker's upcoming classes and seminars, visit www.gatewayonline.com.